Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of the New Artist Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Origin Cross. And if you've tuned in before, you know we're here to interview some of the artists from the New Artist Spotlight playlist. Um, your plug to some of the freshest and most exciting new music from the independent artists around the globe. And today, we have a special guest co host joining us, one of the pioneers of the podcast, Plummy. Hey, uh, thanks, Origin. It's, it's great to be back in the, uh, the chair here interviewing uh i hope i'm not too rusty and i hope i don't embarrass myself for you guys too bad but uh thank you nah, thank you, you. It. great to be here you and wilco been killing the show so i'm uh, honored to be a part of it even though even though he's not here uh, thanks i mean we just tried to take your blueprint and add our own spin to it and keep it going so you can find all the the playlists as well as news reviews tips and a ton more stuff everything new artist spotlight at newartistspotlight.org uh, now, help me welcome to the show today, the guest of honor, uh, Jimmy from Wretched Pinhead Puppets. How are you doing today, Jimmy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. You know, it's an honor. It's an honor. So you're down, in, you're down in Arizona, uh, Origins down in San Antonio, and I am uh, up here in Minnesota. So we're all, we're spanning the, the United States here today. So pretty cool. Oh, yeah. So Jimmy, uh, it's yeah. good to have you on. Um, so anyone who hasn't um, gotten to know Wretched Pinhead Puppets, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, the band, your music, and kind of what led you into becoming a recording artist? Oh, well, yeah, I've been doing this for a while. And actually, uh, Wretched Pinhead Puppets was a band that was actually formed in 1993, believe it or not. Oh. And it was, it was formed with me and my best friend, Russ Graves. And, you know, it's kind of a tragic story, but um, we had played in many bands before. But there was a break, so we decided, hey, let's let's start a band. I'm like, sounds fun. And so he came up with the name, Wretched Pinhead Puppets. We started doing recordings. We did demos. We did a couple live shows. And then, I mean, unfortunately, I, I, this sounds, it's tragic. He killed himself. And so I was kind of left without a band. And he, we started a jingle business together as well. So we were doing commercial jingles for radio stations around town. So I just kind of left music or left, you know, entertainment music. And I went to jingle writing. So I've been writing jingles for the last, you know, 20 years, basically. And, uh, and then it took uh, the pandemic where, you know, business dried up, everything dried up. And I had a studio and nothing to do. So I went back to all the old songs, re-recorded them, and wrote a bunch of new songs. And so it started, and then it started promoting it and it started catching on and people started liking it. So, and then, uh, you know, and then just network, network, network. And uh, then I ran into Ed, Ed Eagle, and uh, kind of got hooked up with, you know, NAS. And it's been a really good relationship. I've been really enjoying it. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, uh, like you said, it's tragic. I'm sure it's, Probably oh, yeah. always hard to talk about that. And I'm sure it was really hard to to pick up and re-record those songs too. Um but you know, I'll tell you what though, Russ, I my uh my friend, he was uh he was a goofy guy. And he was he was a really good songwriter and he was a real good producer. You know, he he had a real, you know, and it it took me a long time to learn the art of recording because it really is an art yeah. and you know he learned from you know we were when we started recording that was the eight you know we went eight track tapes you know reel to reel and so things were quite you know cumbersome at the time and gear was hard to come by and so we were one of the first you know kind of duos to have our own studio which i was kind of very proud of back in the 80s so but uh, he did have a sense of humor and so i, I and he's, you know, if you listen to the music, he's in a lot of the songs, you know, like um, Ghost Like You, uh, Rust, the Sorrow Punk, um, you know, even Jimmy's Auto, you know, he's he's kind of in there. So it's kind of it's kind of fun. But you got to listen for the, You got to listen for all the uh, all the clues. So there's yeah, there's a lot of him in there. You know, I do like and his family likes that I, I'm keeping his name alive. And, you know, it has been, you know, 25 years. But um, no, it's he's he, he left, but he has a good memory, so which is awesome. So, 
So it's like kind of tragic, but celebratory at the same time. Right. So. Yeah. It's kind of, is awesome. I mean, it's kind of great that he can live on through the music too. And that you're, you're doing that for your friend, your, uh, your best friend. So. Oh yeah. And I'm thinking, cause actually there was a, um, I released an album, um, got probably six months ago, maybe a year ago called before they were wretched. And those were, I think it's 16, 17 songs that we actually recorded together back in the eighties. You know, it's nothing that's going to, you know, win any Grammys or anything like that, but it's just kind of a, a snapshot of what we did together. And so, you know, he's got a lot of guitar on there. He's got some background vocals on there. It's still, you know, pretty much 80% me, but just put it out there. It was, it was fun to do. So. Yeah, that's so cool. When did, when did you guys, uh, back to the beginning, when did you guys first find your love of music? Uh, is that how you well, No, actually, I... Because I actually was born in Minnesota, and then I lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin, for about five years mm -hmm. while I was there. I know, exactly. And so while I was there, um, I had an older brother who went to Edison, you know, Edison's high high school, and they were having a talent show. And I always loved music. I always listened to the Monkees and the Hermit's Hermits and all that kind of stuff. But I went to this talent show, and some of the, you know, members of the class had a band. It was, a, it was a trio called the Arlie Husson Band. And I'd never seen a live band before. And these are just some high school kids, a three-piece, and they played Hound Dog. And it was super loud, super loud. And all their, all their friends went crazy. And I said to myself, I got to do this. <laughs> and, and I told my, as we were walking out of the... And I was eight. As we were walking out of the talent show, I said, I told my mom I wanted to take guitar lessons. And so she signed me up. When you know, you know. Exactly. And I still, I, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, years ago, we'd play live, but I haven't played live for, you know, many years. And actually, I want to, I'm, I'm looking for a band right now to play with. So just to bring this all live, it's exciting. So, I mean, because I think the music's a lot of fun. I, I really think that, uh, you know, I don't think that, you know, personally, I don't take myself too seriously. So you, I think you'll see that in a lot of the songs. I, I have some very sad songs like Ghosts Like You and and things and some tragic songs like Numbers and Sun. But uh, I think most of everything is kind of like uh, uh, Jimmy's Auto. You know, it has a sense of humor to it, you know, but there's some reality in there, too. You know, my dad said I should have sold cars. Instead, you know, I bought a used guitar because my parents were always like, make some money, make some money. And, you know, they always mm -hmm. thought I could have made more money doing something else. So that's where that that's where the song came from, really. So when you speak about that and making money and basically uh, just being successful in this business that we put our time into. Right. Yeah. To do that, you need fans, you need listeners. So yeah. let's take a second to talk about, you know, how we actually can reach new listeners and grow mm -hmm. that fan base besides just trying to get more streams yeah more streams i think in the beginning it's it was very exciting to see new streams but when they when you have like you know i always like seeing how many listeners i have to how many streams i have and uh when the monthly listeners go down when the streams in the beginning when the streams went down i get upset now when the listeners go down i get upset Right. So, and uh, I heard something. I, you know, I was listening. You know, of course, I, I research all this stuff, and I, 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 I think I'm a student of music promotion, and I've really been uh, concentrating on what I can do. And, you know, and everyone talks about the algorithm and, you know, whatnot. And I learned a couple things in the past year, and. And they were things I didn't really want to hear, but th they were the truth. And the truth is, listeners, the average person, they don't care. They don't care about you. They don't care about your music. They don't care. And on the radio, they don't want a new song to come on. They want to listen to their old songs. And then they want to hear news, weather, and sports. <laughs> you know, we're just, we're just kind of fodder. And they don't, you know, it, it's hard to, to get into somebody's psyche to the point where they want to say, I'll listen to you. So it's almost like they want to, you know, when you think of all the people that we love, 
you know, we connect to them on a personal basis, even though we've never met them in our entire lives. You know, it's just like, because they did this, they're flying around the world, they seem like really cool people. And then they have a new song out, so you go listen to it. And, uh, you know, so nobody cares is the first thing I learned. And the second thing I learned is everyone's trying to figure out the algorithm of Spotify. And I had this epiphany that the algorithm is based on the listener. It's not based on the artist. And so we all think if we get 100,000 streams, it'll get onto an editorial playlist. Or if we get so many saves, we'll get on a a playlist. Or, and uh, basically, you know, just, I think, just producing more music and more music that people actually like is really the only answer to getting more listeners. You know, and, to do things maybe outside of music that people might pay attention to. You know, it's like, I always see these news reports on like doctors who deliver babies that have a band, you know? And so everyone wants to follow him because he's doing something good for the world. And I, you know, it's kind of funny. I joke and I say, I'll probably get more listeners if I wear a wretched pinhead puppet t-shirt around Phoenix and pick up trash every day, (laughs) you know? Because people say, you know, it's really true, though. And so, and, you know, and I have this 47-inch puppet. I'm not sure if you ever noticed my, my puppet. But he's kind of the, uh, the brand of the whole, whole marketing. And I'm thinking I can strap him on my back and pick up trash with a T-shirt on. I'm thinking that would, that would get me more listeners. But, you know, and that's the whole thing. Because I do, I do have a lot of confidence in the music. And I think, but it's just getting that first person to listen and that first person to like you and that first person to put you on their playlist and i think consistency too people want they don't want to fall in love with somebody that's only going to produce a song a year you know they want a song every month they want you know they they want you to be available on social media they want you to be available they want to see your name like they're following somebody that's you know just something's about to happen you know, they want, they want to feel that they're, they're part of something. And I think that's, you know, if we can crack that, if we can learn how to do that, everything else will be easy. That's kind of how I look at it. What do you guys think? No, I think that's a, that's a great perspective. I was going to ask, you know, what, you know, with it being such a huge deal now, it's kind of like the, the gold, uh, the golden ticket landing on a Spotify editorial playlist nowadays, but yeah. Uh, how to get on that and or your thoughts on getting on one and staying on one, but you kind of covered that in depth there. So, yeah, you know, but you know, what, one thing I do think that, uh, you know, we have to do though. And I think, cause the, the cool thing about NAS is I can guarantee you, I'm not sure how many, you know, how many active members are in NAS right now, but it's gotta be, you know, 300, 500. Do you know the answer? Uh, somewhere right in the right. Somewhere right, right in there. Right. Yep. maybe four something like that it fluctuates and, you know, and the thing is is you know as we all look at our stats and things like that you know we're all we're, we all get related to each other you know through the algorithm so really just i think once you find one artist that starts getting on editorial playlists wow, they'll start six or something like that it, you know it's just it's it's a kind of a domino effect you know, because we're all kind of growing together. But I think the thing we have to do as artists, too, is we have to keep producing just more and more music and being really consistent. And I think consistency, you know, streaming alongside, you know, other peers is really, I think that's the trick to getting down the playlist. Because I think my goal right now, I mean, of course, my goal is to get on editorial playlists, but it's nice to be on... Um, like radio plays, I've been I've mm-hmm. been getting about anywhere from four hundred to six hundred radio plays a day, which is awesome. Yeah, and I and I attribute that just because I built my catalog up to close to sixty songs, and so like I might be on your playlist, you might have two songs on your on your radio, and I'll and I'll have ten. Right, and, and it's just you know I, I think it's a little unfair sometimes, but I think. I think if we all knew that to just just pump out a ton of music and it will it will end up on the radio and or on Spotify radio. And also, I, you know, I see that just by quantity, you know, Discover Weekly will pick it up. 
and you know try to get on and then what what are the other ones repeat uh, re- release radar too when you release yeah. radar on yeah. repeat i'm sure if you're dropping yeah. more music you you probably have a higher uh higher number of release radars you get put on too exactly like, exactly so i think my you know my concentration is or my my game plan is to try to get on as many algorithmic um playlists and then hopefully we'll get on the editorials mm. you know and then what about a listener how do you feel about listener because those are those are what that gray area kind of starts to come in right because listeners can add you but at the same time there are the the bot playlists are also listener playlists right and so you know i it's kind of funny because it was just i think it was a, you two might have been involved too. I'm not sure, but um, it was a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden, you know, I looked at you know, I was on you know Spotify for artists, and there was like 50 people listening to me, and I'm like, wow, something's going on. Did I did I get it on an editorial playlist? And so, because usually, you know that, you know that little number that says you know now listening, mm-hmm. and it kept going up and up and up, and my song Alligator got a thousand plays that one day did you were you guys did you got get on this list i think ed was on there and there was a few other people but i've been on some of those in the past i, think I don't so. think I, I wasn't lucky enough to be graced with that uh playlist this time but 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 the thing is is it it went up and actually so that one day i got you know like 2500 you know streams and i had like 2000 listeners and then the next day back to normal you know, back down to the, you know, 1600, 1700, you know, streams and, you know, 500, you know, listeners. And so, yeah, so it's, I feel like, you know, everyone kind of, you know, I'm kind of plateauing and it's, that's my big question is how do I get to the next level? Cause I think, you know, NAS is just the greatest thing in the world. And, you know, it gets you, it gets you to that next level. And now as a kind of, as a collective, we have to kind of ask ourselves, how do we get, what is, what is the next level? Cause I think, you know, my goal as an artist and as a, as a business person, as a marketing person is how do you change that 2000 streams a day to 20,000 streams a day? Because that 20,000 streams is you can start paying your bills. You know, that I, that's about $2,000 a month, 20, 20,000 streams a day. So you can pay your house payment. You can pay your car payment. And, and then you can start putting your time towards other things. But uh, so I, that's my big, what's that? Put your time towards making more music too. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so that's my question is how do we get to the next level? You know, cause it's all about getting the next level. And I think, uh, I think that's how I found Ed to begin with. I mean, how I found, I actually, I found NAS through Ed because I was kind of looking you know, I, I look at everybody's numbers and I'm just kind of, and Ed had the numbers I wanted at the next level, you know, you know, he's done really well and he's, and it's like, what is he doing that I should be doing? And so I reached out to him and actually, you know, just kind of said, what, what do I need to do to get to that next level? And he's, you know, and he's one of those guys that just totally surprised me because, you know, everyone's like, well, you can be on my list, but it's, you know, a hundred bucks. You know, it's this and this, you know, Ed was just, we really connected in the sense that we shouldn't be paying for streams. We should be networking. We should be working with a group and, you know, and, you know, there's not a lot of Ed's out there, which, you know, I just, so I give kudos to Ed. So, but, uh, cause he, he knows that too, that as soon as one of us has success, everybody else, it, it what do they say? Um, uh, rising waters raise all ships. Yep, and that's kind of that's kind of how my thoughts in this whole business, and that's why I really think, you know, everyone at NAS should just be just pumping out more and more music. Is you know, because it's just like putting quarters in a slot machine. You know, and my thought is that you know someone's bound to have a hit. Yep, you know that's kind of how I look at it. So. Or or strike a nerve or something or get on a soundtrack or editorial playlists, that kind of thing. So I think as a group, so you're it's saying the more we help support each other and push each other and get somebody over over the hump. Absolutely. The more they can reach back and pull us up with them 
because yep. we're already building that association through this community that we have. Yes, that's totally. And, you know, and you see that, you know, there's a lot of collaborations going on. And, and um, you know, I've co- collaborated with a few people. And, you know, uh, actually, he's not on NAS, but um, Pete Marley from Marvelines. I'm not sure if you, I've worked with him. And, you know, he hasn't really been promoting his music that much. But some of the best stuff, I think, on, on you know, online right now. And he's, you know, I get I get mad at him because he's, he he's not pushing it. He's not, you know, he's not pushing his music hard enough. So anyways, but he, you know, I collabed with him and he great bass. We have such a talent pool of bass players and drummers and vocalists and, you know, and, and like, like even what Ed did with by, you know, getting all the group, you know, singers and you know, it's, it's, it makes it more fun too, I think. So working together. Yeah. And I totally believe it's everyone's lifting each other up. We're pushing each other up, you know? So I think that's, and like, I think I was listening to an interview with David Foster and somebody asked him, what is the number one thing to do to achieve success in the music industry? And his answer was networking. And I would completely agree with that. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, there's, do you ever listen to a song and you're like, you know, how did that sell a million <laughs> copies, you know? And yeah. it's networking, you know, and people need to be spoon fed. A lot of people don't, you know, they're not looking for music. They need it almost fed to them. And so it's like, who do you know that can feed them music? So I don't know. But uh, yeah, networking, I think, is and working together, I think, is really, really the tool we all need to fall back on. So are you guys self produced or do you go to a studio or do you have a studio in, in the home or? I do. I do everything myself. Uh, I'm currently yeah. working on in this room here, rebuilding okay. or in our new house, building up a studio kind of area. Right. So it's exciting. Now, but, do, you, do you work in what what software? What's your your DAW? Uh, I use FL Studio, which is kind of okay. probably more more geared toward electronic Dutch music and, and stuff and and okay. kind of hip hop type beat stuff. Okay, what I what what I was familiar with. So kind of okay. stick with what you're familiar with right exactly yeah i was using mark of the unicorns the performer for many years and then just somehow it just kind of transformed into logic which i think is just an incredible piece of software so much fun yeah i gotta try out logic because i've been i've been transitioning now to mac just because they seem to be a lot more reliable in my opinion okay. and- yeah I, I i have an i an imac and it's eight years old i need to get a new computer but it's been amazing. It's yeah, been I'm, amazing. I'm on, a, I'm on a 2015 Mac right now that I use for everything, and it's yeah, yeah, they're good machine. Origin, how about uh, you? So I use Studio One right now, um, okay. but I record at home. Um, I haven't recorded since I've been in San Antonio, except for like one verse, uh, just because this house that we moved into really high ceilings. It's okay. um, like wood floors, no carpeting, so it's just echo everywhere sure. yeah um so really bad acoustics here but i record in studio one and then yeah. i usually have my uh you know my instrumental and my vocals sent to my engineer and okay. then let's let him do the mixing oh nice nice it always is nice and that's another thing i love about nas is because before i release a song i usually do send it to you know, some other people you, you know charles connelly yep I oh, love yeah. him, you know, and he's not, he's not doing my mixing, but he, he'll listen to my mix and tell me what he, I, what he thinks of it. And I value his opinion greatly. I value Ed's opinion. Uh, John Mitchie, I, I value his opinion a great deal. And, you know, anybody who wants to listen to one of my songs, I'm like, listen to this, you know, tell me, you know, give me your honest opinion, what you think is good and what you think is bad. And, uh, that's another thing I love about NAS. It's just the camaraderie and the. Um, and I think it's, it, I think it, the most exciting thing is is when people produce new music. I think that's the most exciting thing. How about uh, we take some time now and uh, play your song Jimmy's Auto, which was uh, a newer release too. I think it was released yeah. a little bit before Signs, right? Just at the. Yeah. I think it was like two weeks or maybe a three four weeks before signs yeah do you want to tell us a little bit about that track real quick uh, before we before we hit play on it and what it what it means to you and the the process of writing it 
Well, you know, it's kind of funny because as you know, I said earlier, actually how I make my living is as a jingle writer and I do t- TV production, that kind of stuff for local advertisers. That's, that's, you know, quote my real job. And uh, so anyways, I was trying to come up with um, one jingle that I could sell, you know, 20 times to different markets around the country. Because I'm kind of sick of selling one jingle to one person then doing, you know. So anyways, I'm trying to magnify it. Anyway, so Jimmy's Auto came out. I came up with, actually it was supposed to be for Finley Auto, which is up in Flagstaff. I came up with Finley Auto, the name you ought to know, like, you know, ought to know. So anyways, I thought it was really creative. Uh, they thought it was stupid. And so I wrote a song around it instead and called Jimmy's Auto, the name you ought to know. So, uh, yeah, and it's just and that whole thing about, you know, your parents telling you that you, you know, should have sold cars. Instead, I bought a used guitar. And I think at the end of the song, there's that, um, I won't call it a rat. It's just kind of a, like an announcer. Do you mm-hmm. know what I'm talking about? Yep, yep. It's kind of like, so in all those things, like, you know, talks about you know you can't have you know you didn't qualify for a loan but if you're an american citizen you're entitled to and i just list things and everything i listed has meaning to my life it's a very personal song believe it or not so but it's comical i think it's you know hopefully hopefully it's kind of funny it is i I don't know how many uh, what would you call that a disclaimer at the end i don't know how many songs i've heard with a disclaimer at the end but uh it's pretty it's pretty pretty cool, and I was I was telling you this at the beginning, but uh, before we started the show. But my I was listening to it, and my wife overheard, and she goes, "Does this guy write jingles or something?" <laughs> so she knew she picked it right out of there. Which was right. I was impressed with her because she's not a huge music uh, buff or anything like that, but she knew. So yeah, but I, I think too that, but I think I think jingle writing has definitely hi- helped me write better songs catchy for sure it's about the hook and yeah the, it's yeah. all about you know because in a jingle you only get what do you have like five ten seconds to yeah because I, I always tell my clients when i'm doing my sales pitch like you know i mean we have all those you know did you, i mean if, if people are still listening to radio you know a lot of people are on, on you know listen to digital radio but if you're listening to local radio you know everyone still has their presets they just go from one preset to the next preset so you know if a person listens to five seconds of your commercial, you've succeeded. If they know who you are in five seconds, you've succeeded because they're not going to hear the rest of it. So that usually, you know, hopefully opens the door to me doing a job for them. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, let's play the song and let people listen to it. And I'd love to, you know, love to hear comments, you know, good or bad. Do you want to uh, do the honors and introduce uh, your track for us? All right. Uh, Take a listen. Thanks for listening to everybody who's listening right now, number one. But uh, enjoy Jimmy Zotto from Wretched Pinhead Puppets. I should have sold cars, Dad. I bought a used guitar. I got no money. He got no money. Thought I'd learn three chords The one the girls adore and play arenas Sing like hyenas My dad said to me You should have sold cars Cadillac Sports and Jaguars And make some money Big money I'll call it Jimmy's Auto The name you ought to know Selling cars and trucks Selling coast to coast The girls kick the tires The boys pop the hood You'll see me on the TV You'll be looking good And making money Get the cars on the lot, shoot a TV spot, wear a leisure suit with matching cowboy boots and make some money. Make money! I'll get David Foster to write me a jingle And make a million dollars and release it as a single Who knows? Here's how it goes A big car, small cars, credit or cash If you don't love it, just bring it back Service high, prices low Jimmy's Auto, the name you ought to know Hey! Oh, oh, oh. Make some money. Big money. I'll 
Call it Jimmy's Auto, the name you ought to know. Selling cars and trucks, selling coast to coast. The girls kick the tires, the boys pop the hood. You'll see me on the TV. You'll be looking good. And making money. Big money. You've got bad credit. Yet, if you're an American citizen, you're entitled to an autograph, Roger Brown jersey, and football card. A Moderna vaccination, a Pfizer boost, a change, a confusion. A personally autographed picture of Evo Knievel. Alice Cooper's new unlisted phone number. A dream date with Fee Waybill. The original walking candy apple. A Nova, a Yugo, a Gremlin, Big Jim Sports Camper. A bitching Camaro, a white F-150 with three on the tree. An AMC Pacer, or a baby's hand choking a puppet. A wretched pinhead puppet. So uh, thanks, Jimmy, for letting us hear that uh, great tune. Real fun and uh, whimsical, too, I would say. Um, yeah, good word. Do you, do you have a, a plan for your tracks mapped out in your head when you start them, or do you just kind of go with the flow? I'm sure it's different on every uh, every track, but how does no, that No, actually, you know, because I think they kind of start with um, an idea or a riff. And then I am one of those people that... Um, you know, I kind of, I try to learn from great songwriters. And I think, you know, a band I have a huge respect for are the Eagles. I just, I think they're just really good writers, real good producers, real good business people. Harmonies too. Oh my God. Oh, and uh, actually, but they were talking about songwriting and, um, and they were talking about Jackson Brown. And they just remember Jackson Brown would sit at the piano and he'd just play the song over and over and over and then he might make one note change and then he'd keep playing it play it all over again but he wouldn't stop playing it until it was right i think most of my songs get written i'd say 90 percent of them get written probably within within an hour you know they it's like they just come to me but the production of them will take like actually i have a really i'll, I'll kind of pre-announce my next song um it's going to create a lot of controversy, but I'm really excited. It's a super, super fun song, but it's called Jesus is an Alien. And hopefully it will make people laugh. But that song I wrote pretty much in like 10 minutes. But I'm still, it's, I've been going listening to it and making changes on it every night for like the last month. Yes. And uh, exclusive. Know, exclusive. Podcast exclusive. You've heard it here <laughs> first, folks. Yeah, Je Jesus is an alien, and so. Um, so yeah, you you start with like a kind of a skeleton, and then you yeah. have the, the meat and the flesh. Exactly. Yeah, the lyrics lyrics usually is as soon as I come up with an idea, like Jesus is an alien, the lyrics come pretty quick, and I think that that is my you know, like I say, I think my jingle background helps with the lyrics. Yeah, lyrics really come easily once I have a, a concept. So let's talk a little bit about, and you've probably mentioned it already, but uh, like your inspirations just in life and music, whatever. You know, musically, I have to say that, you know, I just, I, the real writers, like I, I love, I mean, all the typicals, like I think Peter Gabriel is one of my favorites, you know, because I like, you know, the thing I like about him, he's very serious, but you, but you know he has a side of a sense of humor. Same with Sting. Um, Alice Cooper was my, my first love. You know, I, I saw a concert. Actually, Alice Cooper was my first concert in 1975. And I have to say, that's probably what changed my life. And he was just, and then when I found out that he was from Arizona, that was like when I was a kid and I knew that I was moving to Arizona when I was a kid, I just, I, I thought, you know, I already made it. I'm just going to follow in his footsteps. But uh, yeah, so yeah, and then of course all the you know, all the guitar greats. I love love Zeppelin, love Black Sabbath, huge Black Sabbath fan. But I love everything. I, there was a big time where I was playing classical guitar, you know, all through high school and through college. So I like to. Um, I think I'm a better guitar player these days. I don't think I'm as fast as I used to be, but uh, but I think I'm a better player and I think I'm a better writer than. Uh, and that's, that's another thing too, is everyone's, you know, I know I have all these, I have some friends that have these high school kids and they're, they want me to mentor them. And I keep telling them it's, it's not about how fast you play. It's, it's what you write and how you connect to your audience. And they're like, you mean if I, if I, 
it's not important that I play faster. I'm like, well, if it's important to you, you know, but uh, I, I think, you know, some of the most successful people are, I think just the people that connect on a human level. And it, I was always trying to be the best guitar player because I thought if I was the best guitar player, I thought I'd be the most successful guitar player, but that's really not true. So anyways, I'm rambling again, but what was the question? Oh, I think I answered it. My you influence. Did answer it. Yeah. You did All right. It. Now it's time for us to transition into the world famous NAS Quick Fire Five. Okay. You're going to be asked five questions. You'll have no more than 15 seconds to answer each one. Okay. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. Okay. This is my first time doing this, but uh, all right. We'll start a Chevy Chase drum roll, please. Uh, okay. Question one: What is your favorite song from the new Artist Spotlight playlist? You know, actually, I have to say it's uh, Charles Connolly's "The Birthday Song." That's a great just one. Because, just because every time I hear, I mean, because that's kind of you know. Actually, I worked with Charles on the the top twenty, and so I'm in contact with him and. And he's such a talent. And um, that was the first song that I actually, that's what got me to, because I was researching artists that I wanted to be at the next level. And he was at that level. So I, I remember reaching out to him. So actually, so yeah, the birthday song, just because it brings back memories of NAS. Speaking of a guitar too, that song probably has one of my favorite guitar tones on whoa, it. Like that whoa, classic. Uh, whoa, you guys are both new here. But it's been longer than 15 seconds. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's go. All right. What's one song that always makes you want to dance? <laughs> um, um, I was thinking I, it's um, uh, Bust a Move. Okay. Who, who's I was trying to think who sings that? Is that Bust a Move? Or uh, I have no idea who sings it. Like yeah, off the top of my head, from the eighties, right? Oh yeah. And then um, Funky Cool Medina. Funky Cool Medina. Next I love that. I love that stuff. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that makes me dance. All right, I'll keep things going. If you could have the voice of any artist on the planet other than your own, whose voice would it be? Actually, my favorite vocalist, rock vocalist, is Robin Zander from Cheap Trick. Okay. And he's yeah, he's 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 I don't know. He's he's he was my idol growing up. So it's a great voice. Great, great band too. <laughs> Which band or artist that are alive would you most like to go on a night out with? Probably David Bowie. I think he'd be very entertaining, but very, very, I think he could teach me a few things as far as he just, he, he kind of had his, in his own way, kind of had his, his fingers on the emotions of the world. I think he really, you know, him and uh, Tom Petty too. I think Tom Petty would be, would be a real interesting person. Or Dave Grohl. I think Dave Grohl would be fun, too. Great picks. Uh, if you could spend a day with one other New Artist Spotlight artist, who would you pick? You know, it would be a toss-up, probably between Charles Connolly, just because we would probably talk all day and you know, drink wine and talk production. Because mm -hmm. I love talking production. I love talking gear. I love talking arrangements. I love talking ideas. He's, and he's, he's awesome. And he's 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 got a real funny sense of humor, but probably I'd probably have to pick Ed though, because Ed is the type of person that um, just a sincere guy that you know you would game plan game plan on how to you know take over the world. You know he's such an ambitious guy, he's busy guy, but he always wants to help other people. And uh, you know he's he's I, I you know he's a great guy. You know just so yeah, probably either I'd say Ed, but. Charles as the runner-up. Cool. Well, uh, sorry, Origin. Uh, us newbies here screwing it up a little bit, but I think we got through that quick five pretty good. We're going oh, okay. uh, to have the to the have day, huh? put a timer on there and <laughs> disqualify you guys for okay. we'll, we'll whenever. Slow down. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> um, it's been a great conversation with you. Um, we got to talk about a lot of topics in depth, which yeah. um, we don't get to do with everybody every episode, you know, yeah. and got to get a lot of meat and potatoes in this conversation um before we go do you want to tell everybody um listening where they can find you on social media and different things yeah like that? actually uh, you know if you just the coolest thing about having you know the name wretched pinhead puppets or my or my new or jimmy tv is that um you can google it 
and you'll find me. I'm on like the first six pages of Google just because of everything I release and Wretched Pinhead Puppets. So, but you can find most, if you want to go direct, just go at Wretched Puppets. And you'll find me on Instagram, on Twitter, and TikTok. So, and, and reach out, you know, with questions, reach out with, you know, if you want me to listen to your song, reach out, network. I love networking with everybody. Yeah, so reach out and because I I'm hopefully I'm very accessible and yeah, anything I can do. Like I fit one thing too is I remember when I first started this, I probably wrote a thousand notes on Twitter to people. And I might have written out to you, I think I probably wrote to you guys, where I wrote, hey, you know, I, like as an example, like Origin, I said, I'm just reaching out. I just wanted to say hi. Um I just listened to your song, you know, conceited. And um Loved it. I, I'm following you now. Here's my song. You send the link. And if you like it, follow me back. That's how I got my first 500 followers. But I proved to them that I did something for them before I asked them to do something for me. So I think that's because I feel a little bad for people that just like constantly sending out notes saying, this is my new song. Listen to it. You know, usually I just delete those. Yeah, I guess <laughs> spam, spam me there. Yeah. But if somebody says, hey, I just listened to Jimmy's Auto and you know, I thought it was funny. You know, could you listen to my song? I'd, I'd be like, I'd listen to it all the way through and I would probably give, give them my opinion. And um, yeah, I think that's networking. That's the way, that's how to grow following and keep pumping out more music. So that's hopefully giving people what they want. So yeah. Cool. That right so, there is a Jimmy TV gem. Yeah. Reach cool. out, reach out. Absolutely. Well, it was uh, it was awesome getting to chat with you and meet you, Jimmy, and uh, can't wait to uh, con- continue the conversations offline with you. And uh, uh, thanks for being on the show today. And thanks to all who tune in to these episodes every week uh, and being part of the New Artist Spotlight family and helping us grow and uh, giving us radio play and all that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Appreciate and a big right. thank you to you, Plummy, for stepping up um, when we were down a host. Uh, getting back in this seat, shaking off all the all the rust, and I'm no Wilco. Going. I don't I don't know if anyone would rather trade a, a, a beautiful English accent like his away for a Minnesotan one. But <laughs> I'll take the Minnesota. I think it was I think it was uh, you know it was meant to be. You know I got yeah. our Minnesota roots. You fate. know it was fate, and we could all hate on the the Green Bay Packers together. So. Yes, there you go. There you go. It's a beautiful thing. All right. <laughs> well. Uh, Great chatting with you guys. Take care, everybody. All right. Take care. See you later. Peace.